Hi guys, oh my god, we just had the most major level interruption to the show. If you were just joining us and wonder where we went, we apologize. Technology, as Anam was saying, can sometimes get in the way of process of creating. We got disconnected and to those on Twitter, we are finally live. So thank you for joining the Shine Out Loud show. We are here with Anam. Bowenyo. Bowenyo. And I'm I'm very cautious about pronouncing mispronouncing names because for me it's a big thing because actually pronounce someone's name with reverence is very, very important. Now I am talking to a multi-textile design artist. This is a woman who is not just a designer, a creator, an artist. She's also a founder. She's a founder of the Black British Female Artist Collection or the female yeah, female yeah. artist collective. And you do all of that and you create am amazing pieces and we we're just talking about your background into art and what drives that and also we were just talking about um the link between identity mm. culture and your art yeah. and you were just trying to explain that for us yeah so um i was just saying that uh, the majority of my work kind of looks at um, nature and tries to reflect the freedom that the natural world has and how as um humankind we've kind of lost that and um with the kind of age of technology we've become so dependent on that and we're kind of losing track of um the things that are important which is kind of energy and um and that kind of natural freedom that we have as animals, which we are for the most part. Um, and then looking at the work I've been doing more recently, um, which is looking at my identity, mm -hmm. um, looking at issues that I face as a woman, as a black woman, um, and trying to communicate that through my work. Um, and I was just saying how important it is that, you know, obviously my work is for everyone, but it's more so for our community because it's important for us to be able to see ourselves reflected in art as well. Okay. And, you know, this is actually very important because you're talking about community, you're talking about, you know, creating work that is consumed by all. Mm. And I think that's also one of the things because when we talk about art, there's this idea that, you know, Banksy's owning such great artwork does not belong to us. Mm. We do not buy, partake in it. We do not share in, we, we seem to have, it's almost us, almost right now a self-exclusion from it because it's like, I'm busy. I have work to do. I have, as we said, mm -hmm, substantial work to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, is it a case that we are excluding ourselves from the art realm in terms of owning, consuming, sharing, even celebrating art? Or is it a case of still there's this kind of lack of diversity in the art world? I think it's for the most part that, that there's the lack of diversity. Um, and I think this is something that we are starting to address, but it has had that knock-on effect mm -hmm. of that for... Um, the black community or for people of colour, we feel that art is not for us because it's very exclusive. Yeah. Um, you go to any of the major museums and it's rare that you'll fit, see work by people of colour that you can identify with. You know, the most times when you see classics and there is a person of colour, they're in a role of servitude. And even the people that work in the museum, the people of colour that you see are usually working in the shop mm -hmm. or working as a security guard, where are the curators, the dealers, you know, in the professional art world mm -hmm. that look like us? Because when that is addressed, that will also have a knock-on effect on the work that's being shown and that having more reflection and more diversity and therefore having a, the community then feeling that sense of, okay, there is some inclusion for us. There is, you know, we are part of this world. Um, and I think that has, that's been going on for centuries. I mean, even the way that African art is contextualized and the words that they use to describe it, like mm -hmm. tribal, make it seem lesser. Mm -hmm. um, but yet yeah, these are African art antiquities. You, when, you know, you go to freeze and you see them being sold for ridiculous amounts of money, but we're told that our work is tribal. You know, and all of these kind of the language around yeah. that kind of starts to create certain mindsets. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have this knock on effect where 
you know, your parents are telling you that you shouldn't become an artist <laughs> because you're not going to make money because, you know, they don't see it as something that's valuable. Yes. So I think those are the things that we need to change. Um, and it's, it starts from the school, from young people going to school and seeing work in the book, in the art books that, it's, that are made by people of colour and those works look like them mm -hmm. and they're not in those roles of servitude or, you know, the women aren't being depicted in a certain way. They're actually beautiful just as they are. You see works by amazing artists like Sonia Boyce and, and they are just making work about us in everyday life. Right. And so you see that and you're like, oh, well, that's me, you know. I went to a show at Tyburn Gallery, um, mm -hmm. an artist called, called Kuzene Violet um, Huami, and um, she had done this beautiful collection of works kind of based on her family portraits. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely stunning. And I was with my friends and we were saying, oh, that's like our, you know, our pictures from home of mm -hmm. us, you know, on the sofa. And, and it really, it, it's, it's the smallest thing, but it, is, it makes such a difference just to see yourself reflected in everyday life, which is what, you know, you've seen in the classics for years and years and years. And we're only now starting to see that, you know, for ourselves, you know, in that there are works of art out there in these gallery spaces in central London where you can go and see yourself reflected in the most positive light and that's really important. No, th that's not important, that's actually vital. It's vital. It's, exactly. uh, it's vital to our yeah. self-identity and um, it's actually vital to quite a few things but I'm, before I go back to that I want to actually say because you, you spoke about curation and spoke about you know being in the business of art. Mm. You and Arti have curated a few shows haven't yeah. you now? Yeah and this is internationally, what is the one thing that artists of colour need to do to get into those doors? I think that's a difficult one because I think it's different for every artist because it depends on the kind of work you make mm -hmm. and where you want your work to be seen. Every artist has a different goal. Some artists just want to make work, community work, or they just mm -hmm. want to do installation. There are artists that want to be more commercial. There are artists that want that conceptual work and they want the commissions and they want to be in, you know, the big biennales and the mm -hmm. big fairs. So it definitely um, varies and it depends on, you know, each artist's personal goal. But I think what's important, like I said before, is that on the professional side, there's more diversity because that's where these are the people that go searching for the artists. Mm -hmm. These are the people that will find an artist and say, okay, I want to work with you and I want to put you in this show, or I want to put you forward. And they start growing these relationships. And the more artists that are out there, then I think that starts to buck the trend because it's all, it's all about trend basically. And when, like at the moment, there's a real interest in African art. And so African art is everywhere. And that's mm -hmm. why um, art fairs like 154 are doing so well now because okay. it is like the big trend. What is art fair 154? So 154 um, started, I think it's, this was its fifth year and okay. it runs every October, the first week alongside Freeze. And it's, it's just, it's amazing. So it's 154 African art fair. So the idea is one continent, 54 countries, as in Africa as the continent. Um, and so this is the one fair that we have de dedicated to African and diaspora art in the UK and they also run in New York and for the first time ever in March they will start in Morocco as well so that'll be the first awesome. one yeah on um, the African continent um, and it's basically as it says it's trying to create a platform for African art um, in the UK um, and you have artists and well galleries uh, showing work by artists from all over Africa and um, artists that work in the diaspora as well. I okay didn't hear about it. Haven't heard about it. It's been running for five years. Yes. So again, this is the the whole conversation that it's not widely known. So what yeah. can we do to start putting that information out? How can we share the information in greater details? Yeah. How can people find out more about this? Where do we need to plug into? Yeah. And I think the first place I will say people need to plug into is your art collective. Ah, yes. So tell me about your art collective. <laughs> so um, I founded the Black British Female Artists Collective in 2015 and late 2015 and it kind of stemmed from a lot of conversations I was having with other artists um, who were feeling the same frustrations as I was that there weren't that many platforms for us to show our work let alone sell um, and just to have those audiences that actually understand our work and mm -hmm. have that kind of real relationship with our work. Um, and so 
I just thought I need to do something about this you know we're always complaining about stuff but you know unless someone tries to address the problem how do we make a change mm -hmm. so and the the idea behind the collective was um, to get uh, women artists together and it was specifically women artists because um, I feel black women have it much harder in it's 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 no it's a known fact black women have it much harder and in the art world it's no different mm -hmm. um i mean i say all the time you know you ask the majority of people to name a black british male artist and they can name at least one even if it's um chris ophili yinka shonibare they can name at least one mm -hmm. but how many can name women i certainly couldn't when i started this collective and that is a really sad state of affairs because it was only in researching the collective that I began to learn of this huge um, arts collective in the 80s called the Black Arts Group, which included women, which included amazing artists like Lubaina Himid, who's now been nominated for the Turner Prize. Wow. Artists like Sonia Boyce, you know, artists like um, Claudette Thompson. And it's, it's frustrating that it took me doing my own research to find this out and I have gone through arts education from secondary school through university and in university my um, uh, one of my teachers actually introduced me to Yinka Shonibari and that was the first kind of black artist that I you know ever came to know of um, and so this is what I say that it kind of starts with education because how many artists have that same story? How many artists, be you self-taught or have gone through arts education, mm -hmm. have you had to go and search yourself to find these artists that look like you and are creating amazing work that talks to you because you identify with that story because they're telling your story. And it's also the fact that for Lubaina Himid to put, you know, she also created a collective of um, artists of women right. of color and they did this show, um, The Thin Black Line, which was then um, brought back in, I think it was 2012, at um, Tate. And 2012, I had moved back to the UK and I was starting to work in the arts and I'd never, I didn't hear about this mm -hmm. exhibition at all. Wow. Um, and so again, it's like you say, it's, there is a real kind of lack of promotion as well around diaspora and arts specifically. Um, I said earlier that there is a huge kind of trend now for African art. Um, which is fantastic because it's giving artists from Africa the platform that they desperately need um, but in the same vein it's now creating um, a space where diaspora artists don't really have a voice mm -hmm. because we're not kind of creating that kind of work yeah you know there is this thing that especially in the UK um, that black art is African art basically and African art has a certain look again in the quote marks tribal and so for us yes you know I'm gone in but I was also born in the UK I've also gone through arts education here my mm -hmm. work doesn't necessarily reflect that I mean you can see some of my work here you can't look at this painting of a stargazer lily and say that that's African <laughs> guys I'm just gonna move for all of you who's listening live I'm just gonna move our twitter camera because we have twitter feed and i'm going to pan to some of the artwork because <laughs> they are absolutely gorgeous so this what are we looking at here right here in the middle so that one is part of the flora lily series so all three of those are part of the flora lily series um and as i said i'm very inspired by the natural world um and specifically flowers i think they're so beautiful and when you kind of honing closely to just the, pe the petals and the veins and you know looking into um, just everything in nature has um, synergy and so you'll see like the veins and the petals and you realize that it's just like the veins in and the blood vessels in our body when you you know look at it under a microscope mm -hmm. um, and again it's like I say it's finding those similarities between man and nature um, you know what your work is really amazing and thank you. and I don't think anyone will look at your work and necessarily say it's tribal work yeah and I think you know you keep saying that every time you say the word tribal mm -hmm. art I, I try not to giggle because mm -hmm. I remember reading at one point that the when the I call it the house of stolen stuff yeah. aka the British Museum <laughs> yeah. 
What? They stole stuff. <laughs> the house of stolen stuff. Um, tried to label the Benin bronze head. Mm. And at first, it was then mocked as it couldn't possibly be African work. Mm. And they tried to find ways of appropriating it and claiming it was created by somebody else. Mm. And as somebody, I was born here but had the good fortune of being educated in Nigeria as well. Yeah. I remember the tribe called the Nupe people, which is part of Nigeria. Okay. And they were the ones that, you know, the Nupe people, the Benin bronze head mm. and the artwork they created in bronze at the time when they assumed that Africa did not understand what bronze was, mm. let alone to be able to construct it out of art. Mm. So every time you say the word tribal art, I instantly have flashes to the bronze head. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, yeah, but if it's so tribal mm. and not worth your time, mm. give it back, please. Yes. I'm just, I mean, I'm really yeah. just saying for a friend. Yeah. I'm just yeah. asking for a friend. Yeah. If, if you guys don't really like it, yeah. give it back. Yeah. We'll take it. Yeah. We'll, we won't charge you guys the fee for showing it for the last how many years. We won't charge you for it. We'll mm. gladly take it back. We won't, we just call it quits. Mm. So, and I think that's when we start putting the value. And again, yeah. going back to how our parents' generation and before them, did not value yeah. the work that we our own work mm. so i think again is it's the education has to be within yes. the schools and yeah. and the system yeah but there also needs to be an internal education yeah. within us yeah i think no, the definitely. onus now is an art yeah. as an artist what do you think yeah. no definitely um and i mean part of our aims as a collective is to work with institutions um work with schools to start kind of just showing that we are we are here mm -hmm. we exist um and showing the younger generation that you know there are artists that look like you they are creating work and that art is a very viable kind of career um and also just kind of working with the community as well trying to do projects within the community mm -hmm. because like you say it's about changing that mindset outside of the education system as well um and then we also want to work with artists uh, across the diaspora in africa and the, in the caribbean as mm -hmm. well um and we actually just came back um from doing our first cross-cultural exchange project in ghana um this august um and that was basically uh, working with three Ghanaian artists and three artists from the BBFA coming together, sitting and talking and learning from each other about, you know, the issues that we face as artists in the diaspora and what female artists mm -hmm. in Ghana face because, you know, there will be similarities but there will be huge differences as well. Um, and then through that we came together and did a, a collaborative exhibition um, which went fantastically well. Um, and it just showed that there is a real need for this. I think um, it's it's not since the 80s, I think, was when artists were kind of moving around a lot and, mm -hmm. you know, working with artists globally. And I think it's so important because one, it's a great way to develop and challenge you as an artist and develop your practice. But I think it's also really important to open up those conversations um, because in that way, I'm hoping that we can really affect change because the more we come together and work, the stronger our voices. And so if we are tackling these issues of us being black women and the different challenges we face in different areas of the world, if we come together, we're able to really affect change by having that strong voice and having a strong voice globally. Um, so I think that's really important. I like that. And I really like the idea that we start looking at this global mm. pattern, not just what's happening here in the States, but a global thing mm. wherever we are in the diaspora. Because yeah. people think whenever we say people of color, we think immediately the UK, the US. Yeah. And there's also a lot of art going on in Europe exactly. within that as well. So exactly. my, my next question for you is, um, we keep talking about the collective mm. and you know, you are a collective of how many? Six. Who are part of the collective? So, um, now I'm just I love these ladies so much we are <laughs> such a sisterhood and I'm just like you know when you start something and you feel like you know you know you're on the right path mm -hmm. because the right things come your way um so uh we have Adelaide Damois who is an amazing 
figurative painter um, and actually she has kind of moved and, and grown and she's now working on body printing and it is just mind-blowing oh. her work is so stunning please go and check out her website um, adeladanoirarts.com I believe um, and we have a sculptor Arlene okay. Wandera who again is just as amazing um, so Arlene um, she actually has had a fantastic year before um, she was one of the artists mm -hmm. alongside Adelaide who um, came out to Ghana with me um, to do our project but just ahead of that she'd just done a project so she's in another um, collective called Duck and Rabbit and they just delivered a project <laughs> in Duck, South and Rabbit. Duck and Rabbit yes and they just delivered a project in South Africa mm -hmm. um, and just before that she was in Venice because she was okay. also part of the Kenya Pavilion um, at the Venice Biennale so yeah she's 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 big things <laughs> she's okay. holding her own um, and we also have Cheryl um, Sableton who is a uh, multimedia artist so she works through film photography and collage and mm -hmm. she's working on collage for the most part for um, um, uh, for kind of last few years um, and her work is really beautiful really interesting and I don't know if um, people know of the works of people like Romare Bearden who is an African-American artist if you don't know about Romare please do go and he's his work is actually at Soul of a Nation which is the biggest show um, that's been running at Tate Modern and covering um, arts in um, in America, so within the African American community, mm -hmm. kind of around you know the the age of, of Black Power, and it's just for any Black person, it's just really important that you go and see the show, and it finishes this weekend, I believe. So um, please do go out and see it if you haven't. Um, and then we also have Colleen De Souza, who is like just immense she's a street artist okay. and her work is just immense so she's been working through a golden series at the moment and she's just recently finished a um a piece that's kind of a homage to you know the 90s era hip-hop so you've got people like salt and pepper you've got Ooh. LL Cool J you've got KRS One who actually I don't know if he came into town especially for this because I haven't had a chance to catch up with her but he was actually in the UK recently and went down to see the work um, because he heard about it back in the US and kind of sent her a video to say thank you and then he came down um, to see the work so um, so yeah Colleen de Souza also just like doing amazing things um, and myself obviously um, and then another beautiful, beautiful uh, painter called Aisha Faisal mm -hmm. and her work is, it's just, it's stunning. So it's looking, it's very kind of spiritual and um, looking at energy mm -hmm. and how we are reflected through that. So she, do, she does these beautiful, um, they're not self-portraits, but everyone always says they kind of look like her a bit, mm -hmm. these um, images of women um, and her sense of colour is just stunning so each piece you see you just have this kind of kinetic reaction to because wow. the work is just it talks to you on a on a spiritual level because it is all about that energy and it's reflected in the colors that she uses so it's just beautiful so yeah I mean you know obviously I'm always going to be biased because you know <laughs> they're my girls but they are all just in their own right fantastic artists and creating really beautiful work that needs to be seen Oh, you sound like you are totally in awe of each and every one of these women. Definitely. How can we find out more about the Black British Female Artists Collective? So, you can find us online. Um, so, our site is bbfablog.wordpress.com. Um, also, obviously, on Instagram as BBFA Collective and Twitter, BBFA Collective as well. Um, and yeah, we will be working on some more projects mm -hmm. and looking at doing a lot of exciting things next year. So we're kind of, you know, got a bit of downtime now to plan everything. Um, but yeah, watch out for us because this is only the beginning. Awesome. And do you, are you guys going to have an exhibition? Are you yes. going to show your work here? Yes. Yes, when, definitely. When so it's more <laughs> happening next year. So we're actually working on our first group show mm -hmm. and it's around a central theme. Um, and so we are working towards that for kind of early to mid of next year um, and then also working towards another cross-cultural exchange which will hopefully include all six of us working mm -hmm. with six artists 
Um, so yeah, and then a few other projects because we've done talks and things like that as well. Um, but we're just trying to kind of pace ourselves out because it's been quite full on this year. So um, just yeah, trying to plan out the year strategically. Um, but the two main things will be our um, first group show and then our next cross-cultural exchange. Well, you have to keep us informed so Definitely. we can share with our platform and our people who listen in and also we can share it to across you know our networks because i think that the onus is on us to share yes. and inform and let people know that this kind of work is going on because like i said we end up not knowing yeah. it's too late yeah yeah no thank you no i really appreciate it <laughs> you're welcome i mean it, it's funny because you you know i i I met Adelaide a very long time ago and I interviewed her and it's funny how things come around in a right. cycle yeah. and to know that her work has moved on because her work was amazing then. It, yes. So yeah. I can only imagine the growth it's of her work. just beautiful. It's really, I'm just, I'm so excited for her because I feel like she is going to blow up. She is just amazing and just such a beautiful soul as well, which is lovely. So. So we should remind her that, you know, we got that interview in way back when, before she became famous. Adelaide, we know you're watching this live Twitter, so just in case, what you know, you do blow up. No, no, not if. When, when you yes. do blow up, remember that, you know, we interviewed you way back when. We're just saying. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so even thinking about your work and how far you've come, how has your work evolved? What, what's what been the changes in your work? Um, I think for me, it's weird because I have two different sides to my work, I guess. So I have these kind of really expressive floral paintings, mm -hmm. and then I have the more kind of textural works like that piece with the wire um, and those below. Um, and so, but I really enjoy working in both formats. Okay, um, so hold on one second. Let yeah. me try and see if I can get people to see. Okay. The... Excuse the mess, people! <laughs> so that piece I've seen on your website, what yes. is that piece? So that's part of the Wings series. So again it's looking at nature. butterfly wings looking at nature um and it's again the idea of freedom and a flight um and i always like to kind of drill down and kind of do real close-ups of the things that i do studies of um and it's really funny because it gets to a point where you can't actually tell that that is a butterfly wing because it's it's quite abstract mm. um and I just love playing with texture. So those were painted on tissue paper. And so that's why it's got that kind of really crinkled effect to it. Um, you painted on tissue paper? On tissue paper, yeah. Oh my God, that <laughs> is incredible. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I think that's the one thing I love about um, being a textile artist is that you just get to play and manipulate materials. So at the moment I'm working on a new collection of works mm -hmm. and working towards a solo show and it's investigating hosiery, so tights, um, because I was interested in the fact that it's only very recently that we've seen this growth of brands that create nudes for yeah. women of colour. And so before that, standardly, every black woman you saw would be wearing black tights in the winter because those chocolate tights are just not the ones. No. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I was just really interested in investigating that because, you know, again, in a very simple product, very simple commodity, you know, women of colour were completely invisible and the nude colour was, you know, a nude for a white woman. So where, Actually, were, where we, don't were we? Even, we don't even think that's nude for white women because it's yeah. like a weird sound. It's a very colour. weird colour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, and so I started researching into that and it was really kind of appalling to find that, you know, tights were invented a century ago and it's only now that we're seeing these brands that cater to us. Um, and so throughout this whole time, we've just been invisible and you never think about it but all of these things have you know an emotional effect on us but you we you know we just carry on mm -hmm. you know we buy our black tights and we keep it moving <laughs> <laughs> but i think it's definitely it's something that needs to be addressed oh and yeah i was looking at um advertising specifically in the 20s mm -hmm. because it, that was a point when you know the sexualization of women became you know kind of the norm um, and again, in that space, in advertising, we weren't present whatsoever and we haven't been present up until now. Um, but, you know, there were 
instances where we were present but in a very derogatory sense so there was a brand called onyx hosiery um never heard of it well yeah this was way back in the 20s but um the images were of little black children and it was because it was black tights and so it was like this is the blackest black you can find <laughs> and it's just very disturbing it's very very disturbing and then you've got um brands that had um you know, each pair of tights has a colour name. So mm -hmm. there was one called Darkie and it had a picture, a little caricature of a black cotton picker with a banjo. And so okay. all of these are really problematic. And obviously at that time it was the norm mm -hmm. for, you know, for it to just be so brazenly blatant, although you say that and then... Uh, then you have Dove. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, we weren't supposed to call names. Um, we understand you apologize for missing your mark. Not sure what that mark was, but we'll continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and actually just recently, I don't know if you saw Fuse ODG had posted a picture, I think it was just yesterday, of an ad in um, Ghana. A kind of huge banner ad in Nivea. Ghana. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Nivea, we see you. <laughs> we see you too. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting because, you know, you go onto their, and I think a lot of people are saying this in the comments, their UK and US sites, and, you know, they're promoting diversity and, you know, you know for all. And then, you know, on the continent, you go is, home. Uh, exactly. We can help you get a little lighter. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so yeah, um, my my kind of current work is investigating all these things, and so again, I am playing with material. So I'm mm -hmm. actually using the tights to create my work. So I'm cutting them up and creating yarn and knitting with them and stitching with them, printing on them, and just playing. So that's what wow. I mean when I say I just I love the freedom that it gives me. You know what? So that explained the tights in the corner. Yes. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything when I came in. I'm like, okay, maybe she's kind of, she has a little collection going. I didn't want to be rude and ask. I was like, you know what? I'm in your studio space, so I shouldn't ask too many questions. But she's a creative. <laughs> she's just weird. Exactly. I, was like, I, I won't ask these things. But now that you've clarified, you know, I think, you know, we, we talk about this. And it, it's funny how we are supposed to be at a time when we, are, we should be post- these discussions exactly but it seems like now more than ever we need to have these discussions yeah. we need to have these discussions that say uh we want to be seen in mm. a particular light and we will no longer be accepted and i'm, yes. and I'm talking very emphatically about black women how yeah. we are shown how we are depicted in yeah. either print or not depicted yeah. in print um you know any form of media mm. and what I find now disturbing is the other end is now we're being depicted again is going to that other extreme of yeah. the very sexual other yes. and it's like yeah. so it's either we're very sexual or we are very the you know the big mammy type mammy character you know yeah. type situation and it's like no middle ground yeah and then when you do middle ground then you have shows I won't mention um, the soap operas here but mm. again it's, it's a very particular light and mm. I think as an artist, and I know this is slightly out of your room, but mm. what what's going on with the depiction and how can we, on an everyday level, mm. start correcting that? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. Um, there are artists out there creating work that shows us just as we are, mm. you know? And I've mentioned artists before, so I think I even um, I said the wrong last name, uh, Claudette Johnson, rather than Thompson, who, did these beautiful portraits of black women just being and in poses where it's like i'm here and i'm owning myself mm. but you don't see these they're in collections where they're just kind of stored and gathering dust they're not out in museums for us to go out and see ourselves reflected um and i mean obviously i talk from about the arts because that is you know my industry and i mm -hmm. think it's really important and that's why that's another reason why i wanted to start BBFA because I thought it was really important for us to be out there and be seen and so the more that we can create work and we can create our own platforms to show our work and get out into the community so that they see us and see us representing ourselves then the more we can start to try and make those changes because until we own our own voice that is never going to change because in western society they will continue to feed those stereotypes because that's what's comfortable for mm -hmm. them that's not what's comfortable for us and so we need to make those changes no one else is going to do that for us i agree i i wholeheartedly agree and this is what i say about storytelling until we tell our own stories exactly. over our own platforms yeah. until 
we take ownerships on the stories we tell. Yeah. Our stories will always be limited yeah. and casted in a certain light and it becomes the onus becomes on us. Yeah. And which is why I started the show. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I started the show. And then you know, so and then when you look at your work, if you look at how far you've come and where you are right now, yeah. what would you tell your self at 18 starting out fresh and innocent what, mm. what advice would you give her um i think i would say just enjoy the journey i think i put a lot of pressure on myself i still do um and you know i'm not going to the stereotypal african families but you know there's this thing where you know your parents want you to do well and so you're always like striving and always like okay by this age i should have done this and by this age i should have done that and it was i think it was just a case of slow down and enjoy the mm -hmm. journey um i've got to a place now where i realized that um everything that happened happened for a reason and prepared me for where i am right now and so it's just about enjoying it enjoying it and not putting too much pressure on yourself um and with anything it takes time so you just have to be patient because especially you know you get to a certain age you start reading certain books so for instance like the tipping point and it mm -hmm. says you need to put in ten thousand hours to you know yes. really be successful in whatever it is you want to do and i think especially now we're in a society where everyone wants you know fame or fortune now 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 like now this. they want yeah. it yesterday they want it yesterday exactly <laughs> and it's like you know, putting in the 10,000 hours, not only does it mean that you are actually really dedicated, because only someone that's dedicated is going to put in that time, yeah. but it means that you've then become an expert in your field because you've put in all of that time and you've learned from your mistakes. And that's the other thing. We all make mistakes and it's fine to make mistakes. So it's just about learning from it. So, um, so yeah, I think for my 18 year old self, it would be enjoy the journey, be patient. Um, and yeah, just, Enjoy the being that young. It's okay. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> but you know, the fun part about this, and you've done amazing work, and you have this amazing collective of women. How do you take care of you? How do you take care? What What are your self care practices? Mm. How do you take care of the artist within? Mm. That's a really great question, actually. Um, so I am very much about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important, um, and so. I actually have to confess that at the moment I've been rushing around so much that I haven't actually made that time for self-care, which is bad, I know, but I'm going to just be open and honest. Um, but when I do, I mean, I love running, so I go for a run. I've got a beautiful country park right by where I live, mm -hmm. so I go for a run, and that's really helpful to clear my head. Um, I love just dancing to music, so I will just put music on and just dance around the room that's my idea of self-care <laughs> like i just put some mj on and just shock out <laughs> <laughs> for me i think self-care is just about getting myself in that happy place mm -hmm. and so doing things like that is what gets me there um and and then i actually do i haven't for ages but um i uh, have a a massage therapist that I go to that does acupuncture and massage for me and I used to go kind of quite regularly like every month I haven't for ages now um, but that's a, you know it's a really nice treat and it's a really nice way to center myself um, and then meditate which again I haven't done in a long time but you know I think it's, it's really important to just take that time mm -hmm. to try and just be still and have the mind be still um, because we are just constantly thinking, overthinking and um, I mean mental health has been a really huge topic mm. um, especially in our community quite recently um, and I think it is because we just we just don't take that time we, we need to realize that the brain is a muscle like any other thing in your body and you need to exercise it and look after it and so meditation just even if you, you don't really understand what meditation is, just taking some time to just be in a quiet space and just listen to your breathing and just breathe in and out very mm. deeply. It's just so healing. It really makes such a difference. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that, that I do to, to look after the one. <laughs> well, it seems to be working. It seems to be working. Oh, and, you know, so I love that. And it, there seems to be a, a reoccurring pattern because I've interviewed quite a few amazing women in the last few months 
and they all say, I do have these practices, <laughs> but I do have these practices, but, but yeah. And I'm, I'm just as guilty. I'm just as guilty. You know, and we get to a point where we were yeah. not, you yeah. know, and I think yeah. it's very important. And like you said, the mental health and taking ownership of mm. our body, our mm. health is, it's, you know, it's on it's us. Really yeah. So, you know, I can't, cannot stress that enough. Mm -hmm. And if you were just joining us, people, it's nine o'clock. Where have you been? <laughs> Charlie, you are late. <laughs> You're really late. But if you're just joining us, I've had the pleasure of taking the show on the road tonight. And we are at the studio of a multi-textural artist who is just all around shades of amazing. She works in various mediums and works with her incredible collective of six. And and um, thank you for having us in your oh, space. Thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, you're so welcome. And I am looking forward to getting to interview the collective because I yes. think it'll be really awesome be to have you all in the same room. And on top of that, when we think about everything that you're doing, everything that you've accomplished, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. You know, Colombo style. <laughs> one, Just one, one, more question. one more question. <laughs> How do you bounce back? From failure, how do you bounce back when you've experienced failure? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think it's just one of those corny things where it's just time, time, time. Um, there are some. There have been times where I've been really, really low. Um, you know, I've been made redundant a couple of times when I was working in the states and. You know, at that point, you think your world has completely ended and crumbled, and what are you going to do? And it is just time. And I think it's really important to just feel those feelings, feel those emotions. You know, if you're hurt, you're angry, just those emotions need to flow through you. And then you get to a point where you'll start to be able to be objective and figure out what your next step is. Um, but I'm definitely one for just feeling those emotions rather than bottling them up mm. because then that just makes it worse. So, um, yeah, I would think the, the main thing is just, you know, letting yourself ride through whatever emotions you're going through and get to a point where you can then be objective and just realise that it will take time. But don't give up, you know, especially as an artist, you're mm. going to get mm. those, like, how many times over and over and over you just have to keep going if it's something that you really believe in if you're truly passionate about it you just keep going and eventually those doors will open and also don't be afraid to ask for help you know if you get to a point where you just think i don't know what to do mm -hmm. ask for help you know there will be people that will be like don't have time whatever but at least you're putting yourself out there you're asking a question and someone will say you know what you know this is what worked for me give it a try or they'll put you in touch with someone else mm -hmm. you know just never be afraid to, to ask for help and ask questions if you don't know awesome thank you and you know we've come to the point of the show where i ask everybody mm -hmm. what is your so loud moment of the week and i know the week is just kind of we're just still in that mix of mm. it what's your so loud moment my so loud moment so is this where i get to shout out my friends your people <laughs> okay so i have to and definitely this week i have to shout out Miss Lisa Anderson. So Lisa Anderson is another lady in the arts that is doing big, big things. So she, in 2015, created the online platform Black British Arts, okay. which exists solely to highlight and document art by um, Black British artists, basically. Um, and alongside that, she's a curator and a consultant. So she's curated two shows um, for a private law firm. Um, she's also a fantastic writer so she also works within fundraising mm -hmm. um, and she's just an all-round just amazing being and I'm really fortunate to work very closely with her because obviously what um, BBFA and what BBA, BBA are doing are quite similar um, but we also are both on this fantastic um, program set up by the International Curators Forum um, called Beyond the Frame and it's actually tackling one of the things that we were talking about so it's um, working with um, art professionals in the BAME community mm -hmm. so the Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic community um, to kind of address the lack of diversity that is in you know the kind of 
professional arts uh, realm and so it's working with 10 emerging curators um, and so both Lisa and I are on that program so we've been working very closely because of that also um, and she's someone that is just so supportive always champions me she's one of those people that I call when I'm feeling low and I need someone to just be like listen missus <laughs> <laughs> check yourself this is all the good things that you have going on in your life and this is what you can do to rectify the things that aren't going so well um and she's just like a tour de force and uh. you just need to definitely watch out for her and just the fact that she saw a huge gap Mm -hmm. in the market and she realized that where is the space that's just profiling all these fantastic artists from yesteryear that from now that are working and creating amazing work within the black community so please do go out and check her website mm -hmm. blackbritishart.com she's also on instagram um and yeah and just watch out for the amazing work that she'll be doing awesome so where can people find your work so you can find me online and um, so my website is uh, nmgdesigns.com um, and on social media so on instagram as nmgd and on twitter as nmgdesigns awesome and i've been asked to ask you a question mm -hmm. how can we get hold of your artwork i had someone look at the website and was asking about certain pieces of work okay how much are they where can we buy them okay so prices range so depending on um what you're interested in um but yeah just drop me an email so uh, my email is nm at nmgdesigns.com awesome guys you've heard it here the wonderful amazing nm as she puts it for her work <laughs> and let me try this again because I really want to get this <laughs> I mean, right and for me it's important so and then Bowenio. Bowenio. Yes. I think it's a W that throws me in the name because <laughs> I'm used to silent letters and I'm yeah, thinking, is yeah. that silent is that not but yeah. and then yeah. yeah and I can't thank you enough for inviting us out for our first oh, on on the road road show with our suitcase and <laughs> Yeah, the studio comes in the suitcase. I was very <laughs> impressed. Very <laughs> impressed with this as well. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And I'm looking out for the work that you individually are doing, your individual um, women in the collective, and you all as a collective. And I'm looking forward to seeing your work, going to see your work, sharing your work, and actually just generally talking about your work some more. And I'm looking forward to what 2018 will bring for you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So to everyone listening live on Spreaker.com, thank you so much. For those of you on Twitter, hey, hey, hey. this has been fun. It's a fun experiment. <laughs> Don't we just love technology when oh, it all yes. comes together? When it works, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, catch us on the replay. You know where you can find us on iTunes, Spreaker, um, Stitcher and also on our website, and now on Amazon Alexa. So we are everywhere. You can find us. Please listen, like the show, go on iTunes, give us a like, and stop by and have a word with us. You can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. So go out, reach out and touch us. Not literally. Don't. <laughs> that would be just too weird. But send us a message, and we'll love to hear back from all of you. Thank you for listening, and it's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're wrapped up from being live and we're going to wrap this up. Thank you guys for watching us Bye, and Twitter. we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.